So we will allow a minute for all our attendees to settle down before uh, you know I start dot at 4 p.m. Requesting all our attendees to please settle down. We will start dot at 4 p.m. So we are starting the webinar. So Ram, three, two, one. A very warm good afternoon to all the attendees. And I welcome you all to the fourth episode of the season two of the IVET series. Since this is the first episode for uh, 2022, let me start by wishing all my speakers, panel members, and all the attendees a very happy new year. We have always tried to bring new elements and uh, additions to the IVET series uh, for our content. And today it is a, we are extremely privileged to have a book discussion session and we will have a good discussion with the author of one of the leading books that have just been released uh, in the water wastewater space. Uh, so without taking too much time, I would now like to invite Ms. Yasmin Dubash she is the Trade Commissioner for the Council General of Canada. And uh, she, I would like her to introduce her keynote address, please. Over to you, Yasmin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kailash Shirodkar, and welcome, everyone. Uh, we are happy, very happy to introduce Canada and its technologies at the IVET series. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce Mr. Francis Paradis. And uh, fr Mr. Francis has uh, nearly 15 years experience in the Quebec public service. And uh, he has been director of the Quebec government office in uh, Mumbai since September 2019. So the Consulate General of Canada and the High Commission work very closely with the Quebec office to advance our interests in India. So Quebec, as you may know, is one of the 13 provinces and territories of Canada and it is the largest province by area and the second largest by population. So welcome, Francis, and over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So namaste. As mujhe aap se baat karne mein bahat kushi ho rahi hai. Maan hindi sik raha hun is liye mere galat ucharaun ko kripaya shama kijiye. Water is one of the most important natural resources, not only from a social and environmental point of view, but also from an economic development perspective, since it is used, among other things, for irrigations and maritime transport. Unfortunately, water is also a non-renewable resource that needs to be taken care of. Considering its increasing rarity, it should be mentioned that Quebec is one of the most privileged territories in the world in terms of the amount of fresh water found there. Indeed, the Quebec territory contains 3% of the world's freshwater reserves spread over nearly 500,000 lakes and 450,000 rivers of different sizes. This proportion is even more impressive when we consider that the demography of the territory is only composed by 8 that 4 million of people particularly because to the St. Lawrence River, 10% of the Quebec's surface area is composed of fresh water, making it one of the region in the world where the resources is the most accessible. This proximity to water resources has enabled Quebec to develop several centers of expertise in wastewater treatment and sanitation, including, for example, the Centers for Research, Development, and Validation of Water Treatment Technologies and Processes. Several universities have their own research centers, thus contributing to strengthening the knowledge and skill of the Quebec's workforce for the freshwater sector. The aim of these centers is to promote the creation of the expansion of, in of innovative water treatment technologies. Beyond its technical expertise, Quebec has a regime of strict water quality standards. The Environment Quality Act and its regulation respecting municipal, municipal wastewater treatment works 
imposes strict quality control of munip on municipalities. It specifically controls their water treatment process and the operation of the treatment centers. These legal standards are aimed at preserving Quebec's waterways and ensuring that purification practices are standardized. In addition to regulating municipal practices, Quebec authorities promote the quality of Quebec waterways to raise awareness among its population to reduce their drinking water consumption. Thus, the Quebec context has made it possible to build a fertile environment for the development and establishment of companies working in this sector. There are several foreign companies that have set up in the province and export their technology and expertise. Things of Quebec companies that are already present in India, such as Premier Tech Aqua, Velan, Acme, and Ovivo, who will speak after me. Let's also think of Canadian Pound of Quebec, which carried out a pilot project in Agra to help clean up the Yamuna River near the Taj Mahal. This is the proof that we can work together to share our respective knowledge and improve life on Earth. These companies specialize in infrastructure and equipment that comply with the principles of sustainable management. And now, water has become blue gold, sought after around the world, and has become a collective wealth. Countries with easy access to fresh water will become strategic allies in the development of our populations. In conclusion, we must reiterate that these companies represent a great opportunity for Quebec's economic partners to strengthen their governance and efficiency in wastewater treatment. We really believe that we can join our efforts to achieve the global goals set at the last COP26. Please, please have a pleasant session. Danyavad. Thank you, Francis, for sharing this info. And I'm sure the audience would be interested to know the expertise of Quebec companies. And going forward, I think from this session, they would love to interact with any Quebec for, you know, companies that might be there in India or looking to bring their technology here. So thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. It's appreciated to be there. Thank you for the invitation to, to my colleagues from Canada. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so uh, moving on, before we move on to the next session, uh, I would request uh, any questions that you might have during the presentations to be put in the Q&A box and not in the chat box, because then it's easier for me to take up the questions uh, during the sessions. So starting with our session today, I would now like to invite Mr. Sujit Kumar, GM Sales and Marketing, Ovivo India. And he's going to talk about the Ovivo silicon carbide membrane technologies and the limitless possibilities that it throws up. Over to you, Sujit. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kalash. And uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Francis, for the great uh, speech. And I loved the way you spoke about uh, Indy. Congratulations to you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, my name is uh, Sujit Kumar. I have the sales and marketing for Ovivo India. I've been in the field of uh, water and wastewater uh, for more than uh, uh, 24 years now. Uh, it is my pleasure to be uh, with you here today for IW, IWET uh, webinar conference. And thanks to um, the Smart uh, Water and Waste World and uh, definitely the, to the uh, Canadian uh, trade, uh, trade Services who gave, gave, me, gave us this uh, opportunity. We at Ovivo uh, provide process and technological solutions which are sustainable, economical and innovative solutions for both municipal and industrial clients globally. Our commitment is to deliver the best solution to all our customer and the environment. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, today, I'll be uh, presenting on Ovivo silicon carbide uh, membrane technology, which has got a uh, limitless uh, possibility. Uh, possibilities. Uh, I'll try to wrap it up uh, within uh, 15 to 20 minutes and thereafter uh, definitely I'll uh, like to have, I'll, I would like to have a good interactive session on uh, Q&A. Let me share my screen. Uh, I hope uh, 
uh, my screen is uh, visible, uh, Mr. Yes. Kalash. Uh, right? Yes, yeah. please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I'll, I'll be just uh, taking through uh, for 15 to 20 minutes on uh, OVIVO silicon carbide membrane technology, which has got limitless uh, possibilities. The key, the flow of uh, topics would be like, uh, what are the wastewater challenges uh, you have been facing currently and what are the impact on environment and what is the need of an R and the MDR challenges. There have been uh, various other uh, membrane uh, suppliers like you have got in conventional MB membrane suppliers. Like what are the challenges you have been facing and how OVIVO contributes to the um, those challenges and what kind of value addition we bring to the table. That's how uh, the uh, whole topic uh, will revolve uh, uh, today, right? Now, what are the effluent challenges, right? Uh, when you talk about effluent challenges, like you need to treat uh, uh, the uh, water and reuse it. That is one of the challenge. Consistent outlet quality, that has become a major uh, challenge because no, there's no, there's no, if you see in India, there have been um, uh, at, least, at least in uh, municipal wastewater side or industrial wastewater side, it is not running to the design capacities. It is more on an average, it is 60-65% is the water output parameter what you get, right? You never get the design uh, water uh, quality or the uh, hydraulic flow which is designed for. Footprint has been a real concern because everyone want uh, the technology to have with the very low uh, uh, footprint. Right, stringent BNR norm. BNR is biological uh, nutrient removal. Uh, there's a uh, recent, uh, it's not recent, uh, from past uh, uh, couple of years, uh, there have been NGT, National Green Tribunal, has been uh, forcing uh, the uh, discharging bodies, be it municipal corporation or any industries, that the whatever the water they discharge to the uh, receiving bodies, it has to have the 10 BOD, 10 TSS, and 10 total nitrogen. So we are, day by day, the uh, 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 discharge regula regulation is becoming stringent. Plant expansion uh, is also been the uh, challenge because uh, uh, because of the growing population or growing demand. There have been an increase uh, in um, uh, increased uh, um, uh, challenges in augmentation of the existing uh, treatment facility and the plant operation, be it MBR plant or any any other op uh, plant operation, right? And uh, these are the the first slide. What I talked about is the uh, common challenges what you face. If I talk about this, I, I thought of uh, preparing this slide because uh, we are more talking about industrial wastewater, right? I thought of uh, adding this slide. If you see on the industrial uh, effluent challenges, this slowly biodegradable organic compound and which has got a refractory substance, right? Uh, it, it is very uh, difficult to degrade, right? That is one of the key challenge what you face. The high content of organic and inorganic matter, right? Inhibiting and toxic compounds, right? When you have this inhibiting, inhibiting and toxic compounds, uh, definitely biology doesn't work, right? And heavy color detergents with surfactants, right? These are the key challenges what industrial uh, effluent has, and of course the stringent uh, regulations on uh, discharge norms, right? Now, what is the impact on the environment? Right. If you see on the imp uh, impact on the environment, like if you don't treat properly the water, like you are not doing your job, right? You need to have your social responsibility. You need to treat the uh, effluent uh, to the discharge runs so that the receiving bodies are safe. If you don't treat, the dissolved oxygen de uh, depletion will happen to the receiving bodies. You will see the physical change in the appearance of the receiving bodies. Eutrophication happens, right? Um, uh, if you don't uh, do the BNR nut nutrient removal, it's not done. The eutrophication uh, will happen to the receiving bodies. Uh, but don't forget, this water is coming back to you. Once you send it to the receiving bodies, it is coming back to you. So thus, there is an health risk to the humans and increased water purification cost also. You have been investing so much of it and you don't operate the plant properly. You don't uh, select the right technology and you end up in increased uh, water purification cost as well. Okay. Now, what is the need of an hour? The need of an hour is like, you need to have sustainable wastewater management, choosing a right product and technology that is, which is key. Recycle and reuse. This should be the mantra for the uh, whole of India, at least for the industrial, um, uh, industrial clients. And optimize process design. Definitely you can't uh, have a liberal uh, design. You need to design in your process uh, quite optimized, which is workable solution. 
now we talked about the, on the challenges right what is the need of need of an art right now I'll slowly i'll get into an uh, mbr system which is our today's topic right uh, i'll talk about mbr system and its uh, challenges now what is an mbr right an mbr is a membrane bioreactor it's a art of the system right it's coupled with your activated sludge process and a filtration system that is called as mbr membrane bioreactor right it is coupled with your activated sludge conventional treatment process itself. Right? If you see the typical uh, MBR design, uh, you will have the screens coming in. You At, at the inlet, you have the screens of uh, one mm uh, fine screen. Uh, if you intend to treat the water to the biological nutrient BNR limits, let's say BNR uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 BOD, 10 TSS and uh, 10 uh, uh, total nitrogen, uh, by default, you need to have this anoxic tank, right? And you will have an aeration basin. It will be it will be a three steps of uh, process: anoxic aeration and membrane. Right now, what does aeration does? In aeration, usually you degrade the uh, BOD, right? Converting it to CO2 and water, right? Whatever BOD comes in, biological oxygen demand comes in, right? You give the oxygen, right? You cultivate the bacteria, right? And degrade it, right? And in the same basin, you also do the nitrification process. Whatever the ammonia which is coming in, again, you need to uh, blow in the oxygen into the system, right? Uh, and all the nitrates have been converted to nitrates, right? And that water is going back to your anoxic basin. When when uh, when this um, NS3 is converted to NO, NO3, you need to convert that to NO3 to NO2, right? For that, you need to have an anoxic condition without uh, the presence of oxygen. So you have, a, have this uh, anoxic basin, which is typically one, one and a half hours uh, retention time, right? You just convert that to an, a nitrogen gas, right? It's a, it's a typical system. You talk about any uh, treatment plants, MBR, this will be the uh, typical flow sheet, which uh, you would find. Right? Now, uh, I'll, th this is the basics, which, which I talked about. People who have worked on MBR, right? Uh, if they think of, of, of MBR, they will feel that it, it will deliver the reusable quality, right? BOD5 less than 5, a TSS less than 2, turbidity 0 0.2. Great, right? It is fantastic, right? And people also think, right, MBR is known for less footprint, right? Definitely, right? If, if, if you compare with the conventional treatment solutions, right, MBR will have very less footprint, almost, uh, I would say, 40% uh, less, right, for if you go with an MBR. That's what people uh, always assume. And definitely, the, they also think about, about capacity augmentation, small footprint, right, retrofitting ASP to MBR or for the recycle. So this is what people, uh, uh, people's mind would crop up that, if they think of an MBR, these are the things which would happen, right? But it could be challenging, right? Membranes could be challenging. Now, what are those challenges? I'll just address on the challenges and how OVO add values, right? I'll, 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 I'll talk to uh, that uh, later. So these are the people who have used um, conventional membranes, MBR, membrane bioreactors. They knew they can easily connect to these wordings. Right, they will see there's an a TMP limitation. Quickly, their TMP gets increased. Transmembrane pressure gets increased. Premature falling happens. People say that uh, you you need to do the cleaning once in um, um, uh, let's say three months. Right, you end up cleaning once in fifteen days or month. Right, durability and robustness. People say this is this has got a durable life of seven years, but they end up with to something else, right? The actual practical uh, uh, scenarios could be something else, right? Premature replacement, as I said, uh, uh, usually the replacement uh, for conventional MBR, uh, warranty for conventional MBR, people say is it's five years, but they will end up replacing very quickly. Premature replacement happens. Permeability is an issue. Recoverability is an issue. When I say, when I talk about permeability, if you design a system, of let's say one MLD uh, MBR system, within three months of operation, you will see there is a flux decline in polymeric uh, membranes, which, uh, which 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 is proven. And OVO is doing this business for more than two decades. I'll, I'll, I'll catch up on that later. Uh, what we do, right? Permeability has been an issue. Recoverability is one of the major issue. Once 
see any membranes are bound to fall bound to scale the recovery is a challenge right if you are not able to recover those membranes with help of cleaning and bringing back to the bringing back membranes to the original position then it's a, a really challenging situation chemical susceptibility you you will have a uh, you don't have a wide range of uh, acceptance like the, you, there is a, a limit like 3 to 11 ph that's it that is the, that is the limiting factor for any conventional uh, membranes which are available in the market right uh, now how how it affects i'll just brief on those right now what are the operational challenges definitely tmp is one of the uh, operating limits if you see the top uh, slide those are the uh, uh, in the vertical uh, side it is shown as membranes like if when, when the membrane is clean you get a clean flow right eventually when it reaches to 45 days right you have to do the cleaning right when you keep on doing repeatedly right when you keep on doing repeatedly when it reaches uh, 3 psi your membrane would get da damaged when when you intend to clean uh, do the cleaning every 45 days and uh, the frequency is very fast then the membranes tend to damage right now metral dictates that tmp limits because these are polymeric membranes right it cannot handle more pressure right and um, hence like it, it cannot handle more pressure it, it is it is highly chemical uh, it's not uh, susceptible to chemical right you will see that this would get damaged very soon and maintenance challenge yes you have this frequent cleaning issues if, if you see, there are two types of uh, cleaning. You do mechanical cleaning or uh, chemical cleaning. In mechanical cleaning, you take out those mem take out the uh, uh, membranes which have been sludge dewatered or highly fouled, right? You scrap it out, right? Which is very difficult. Or the other option is you need to do the pressure wash, which is not possible for polymeric membrane because there is a pressure limit also. You cannot go more than 3 PSI. Right. So there is a limit or the other option is you go with the acid cleaning and uh, bleach cleaning. Again, you have a uh, limitation of 3 to 11 pH and phylac ppm of hours uh, of the chlorine contact time. As I said, frequent cleaning of any member, any polymeric membrane uh, will lead to membrane damage. The other maintenance challenges. If uh, in polymeric membranes, if you have to do the, uh, let's say, if you have to take out those membranes for some reason, and um, uh, you have to do some kind of internal maintenance in the tank, you need to make sure these polymeric membranes are continuously kept in a wet condition because these membranes are hydrophobic membranes. If you don't keep these membranes um, in a wet condition, this po the pores of these membranes would get collapsed. Eventually, you will not get the uh, required desired uh, uh, output parameters. Uh, or the other option is you keep on wetting uh, with the water or add some kind of chemical. Again, it adds to the cost. The other recovery challenges, the membrane life, right? When the membrane is new, as I said, any membrane is bound to fall and bound to scale. You'll see that. Uh, uh, you operate the system, right? Uh, membrane will get fouled. You clean this, uh, clean the membrane. Membrane will come back to the original condition, and you keep on using it. But after some time, you'll see there is an irreversible fouling happening. Right? Once the membrane is cleaned, you'll see there's a flux decline. You're not getting back to the original position. You'll see there's a flux decline slowly, slowly, slowly. After eventually, after three or four years. Right, you'll see those membranes would become irreversible. Right, that means you can't uh, do the cleaning and recover those membranes. That is the point you decide to replace the uh, membranes. Now, what are the reasons for um, uh, sludge dewatering? Right, uh, sludge dewatering is one of the reasons organic falling and the inorganic falling. This, anyway, it has to happen because you are, you are uh, dealing with a wastewater, uh, so it is, it is bound to happen. These are some of the picture for fouled and dewatered um, uh, membranes. Uh, we have tried to uh, figure out, like in the available in the market, you'll find there are flat plates, uh, flat flat sheet membranes available. On the right side, you can see the flat sheet membranes, which has got dewatered. 
and the middle picture is, uh, shows uh, the allofiber membranes, right? Uh, it's very tricky when once the allofiber membranes uh, get dewatered, it's even very tricky to take, uh, uh, do the physical cleaning, I would say, because of uh, it would look like a bunch of straw. You cannot pull the sludge in between the bunch of straw, right? And the other falling, you can see the iron fallings, uh, which usually happens on the uh, membranes, right? Uh, see, no membrane is immune to falling, right? Or no membrane is immune to scaling, right? The key lies with the material and how easily and quickly the clogging can be removed. The clogging can be removed uh, means like recovery. It, it has to be recovered back. Membranes are bound to fall, bound to scale. The challenge lies like how fast you can recover those membranes and bring it to the original position. Uh, on the falling resistance, like we, uh, it, it's a data available in the uh, uh, publicly available, right? Uh, if you see, polymeric membranes have got the highest rate of uh, organic adsorption. That means irreversible falling, right? Among the available membranes, there are many types of membranes available, among which polymeric membrane has got the highest uh, organic adsorption rate. Now, there are new generation membranes available, right? With exceptional properties. Let's see what are they, right? Now, what we learned is in conventional polymeric membranes, you have a flux limitation, right? You have a transmembrane pressure limitation. You can't go below three PSI. Membranes are hydrophobic. So membranes, there are potential chances of membrane pores getting um, uh, collapsed during the maintenance activities. Falling propensity is very high. Frequent cleaning, it happens, right? Uh, once in 45 days, you need to do the uh, cleaning. And it's sensitive to the chemical because you can't go beyond 3 to 11 pH. And the warranty, what you get is 2 to uh, 5 years, right? Now, what if, if there is a membrane available, which can take very high flux, three times uh, um, of the polymeric, TMP up to 10 PSI, and membrane which is hydrophilic, naturally, which is hydrophilic and polyophobic, which has got a low, lowest organic adsorption rate, non-frequent cleaning, resistant to chemical. Beyond all this, you have the life of membrane, which is 20 years, and the supplier is giving you a warranty for two years, right? Don't, don't you prefer that, right? Uh, I'll, I'll just brief you our experience. Like we have been in this field for more than two decades now. Uh, we are totally submerged uh, into the uh, MBR system. Uh, we uh, used to promote, uh, we used to promote uh, polymeric membranes earlier. Slowly, we are moved out of uh, polymeric because we have found future is uh, something else, right, which I'll share. Uh, usually when a uh, uh, customer gets confused, like uh, in market, you'll find many types of membranes available. You have flat sheet, you have polymeric, you, you have uh, PVD. In, P in polymeric itself, you'll have PVDF, you'll have PES, right? You, you'll have P membranes many types of membrane, right? So customer usually get confused which one to choose, right? So I'll just run this video for a minute. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you can hear the... Yeah, I'm sure uh, you are able to watch this video seamlessly uh, without uh, any technical glitch. Uh, 
yeah, we have a new generation uh, uh, membrane which has got limitless possibilities. Like um, it, it has, it will overcome uh, the polymeric which issues which has been faced. Let's see. Uh, I'll just talk about the membrane material, right? If you see the polymeric membrane, uh, uh, it, it is a petroleum product. It's not an environmental uh, friendly. Polymeric membranes are uh, made out of uh, uh, petroleum product. It's not environmental friendly. Whereas the membranes which we have, the Hello. Yeah, so Jit voice is freezed. Sujit, I believe we are facing some technical difficulty at your end. Can you hear us? Uh, can somebody from the Smart Water team do a quick call to Sujit? to check hello yeah sujit we missed you when you yeah i'm, so, I'm sorry for that yes i'm i'm sorry for that uh, yeah well, whatever uh, uh, precaution you take care uh, you will end up with some technical glitch i'm sorry for that uh, maybe i i missed in the slide in this slide right so you were in the slide immediately after the video about the materials for membranes yeah, this one. Yes, yes, yes. Just sir, you have to reshare the slide once again. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, Sujit, you still have two, three minutes. Yes, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. Okay. Yeah, we can see the slide. You can just play it and make it full screen. Yeah, good to go, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk about membrane materials, like polymeric membranes are made out of uh, uh, petroleum product, which is not environmental friendly, whereas the advanced uh, new generation membrane, what we offer is made out of uh, rocks. It's, it's a simple inert uh, uh, material, right? Uh, if, if at all uh, something goes wrong after 20 years, you have to um, uh, dispose this membrane, it's very easy to disp dispose because you can just crush these uh, membranes and uh, bury it. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, since this, this is, these are all made out of uh, inert material, uh, it's just a manufacturing process. Like we have this SIC silicon carbide powder, which would be extruded to the paste, right? And we expose it to the sintering process uh, with uh, uh, 2200 degree of uh, temperature. We apply on the membrane layer, Right, and uh, the mem membrane modules is formed. Right, it's a silicon carbide, uh, um, OVO silicon carbide uh, membrane modules. Right, the key advantage, key properties of this membrane is which polymeric cannot compensate is the hundred percent recoverability. As I said, the membranes are bound to fall, bound to scale. Right, but the recoverability uh, is the uh, challenge. Right, you can recover these membranes. Right, I'll just brief. Uh, quickly, I knew I'm running short of time. Uh, if you see, as I uh, demonstrated, uh, polymeric membrane needs to be uh, done the cleaning every 45 days. If you go with any uh, silicon carbide membranes, it will, you can, um, the cleaning would take uh, around 90 days, that is three months. That means you are delaying the um, uh, cleaning. When you delay the cl cleaning, like you are saving on chemical, right? You are save, uh, saving on flux, everything. Uh, but since, since these membranes are very robust, it's made out of uh, inert material, you can also do the pressure wash, right? Uh, you take out those membrane, if, if at all it is dewatered uh, completely, just do the pressure wash for uh, with, with two to three kg pressure, absolute no issue, whereas which is not possible with the polymeric membranes. And the porosity, right? SIC silicon carbide membrane has got the highest porosity among the available membrane, right? You talk about the PS or CPE membranes, right? That is the reason we are able to push through more uh, flux, like polymer, uh, compared to polymeric, three times the flux, uh, we can take it. When you, when, when you are able to take more uh, 
uh, flow within the given area, right, your footprint also would come down. Okay. This is some of the comparison on the flux. Like uh, we apply this membrane to many applications, be it uh, um, clear water treatment, be it uh, membrane bioreactor, be it uh, thickening application, MBT is membrane bio thickening. Uh, be it tertiary uh, wastewater or wet water system, right? You can take very high flux compared to the um, uh, any polymeric uh, membranes. It's uh, it's it's typical uh, uh, example what we have shown for an 325 KLD of STP, right? You need a polymeric uh, membrane area of 500 meter square, right? With the flux of 0.65 meter cube per uh, day per meter square. Uh, this is the typical polymeric design. Whereas if you go with the uh, SIC membranes, right, you need just right 30%, uh, 40% of it, 171 meter square area, that's it, right? Your footprint also would be very less because we take the flux three times. Like uh, there we talked about uh, in polymeric, you can take only 0.65 meter cube per day per meter square. Here we can go up to 1.9 meter cube per, per day per meter square. Right? And the hydrophilicity, these membranes are hydrophilic. Uh, it's water loving membranes. It's also oleophobic. It aids oil, right? Whereas if you can see the picture, right? If you put a drop of water on the surface of membrane, uh, SIC silicon carbide membranes will immediately absorb that because it's water loving. Whereas with polymeric membranes, if you put a drop of water on the surface, you, you'll see that it stays there because it, it aids water. It's because it's hydrophobic membrane. And as I said, it's also oleophobic. It uh, it has it has also got uh, negatively charged. These membranes are also negatively charged. Particle around the membrane, be it in with in the uh, submerged membrane sub submerged uh, condition, you'll see the particles are negatively charged. The falling propensity will be very less because uh, the particle around the membrane is also negatively charged, and membrane is also negatively charged. It tend to ripple. And it has got an exceptional resistance to temperature and chemical. Temperature, it, you can, it can handle up to 80 degree temperature. Um, uh, it can handle up to uh, pH 1 to 14, right? And the chlorine PPM, chlorine PPM mass is 50 lakhs, right? We are talking 10 times more than the uh, polymeric. Whereas in polymeric, you can't go beyond 5 lakhs. Here we are talking about uh, 50 lakh PPM mass. Yeah, this we talked about it. And it's easy to install also, right? Uh, like it, it comes with 160 mm module, right? One module will have six meter square area. You can just put one by one easily. See, Th this will be tricky where if you ought to install this, uh, install the mem membrane system in the basement where you have the clear height will be very less. In that area, you can have this kind of uh, arrangement. And definitely it gives you the superior treatment, uh, BOD less than two, TSS uh, less than two, ammonia nitrogen one, right? You, the discharge lim uh, limit, even the SDI less than three, you can straight away pass this water to the RO system. No need of any further treatment. It's some of the picture of our uh, treat, uh, treated uh, water. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just sum it up uh, uh, quickly. Uh, it can handle up to 45,000 MLSs because it has been used for various applications, including uh, membrane thickening, right? 90 LMH is the flux, whereas compared to 25 LMH, what um, the polymeric membranes uh, uses, right? This membrane is hydrophilic membrane and oleophobic membrane. Thus, it has got a low propensity of um, uh, falling of the membrane, right? And it also repels the oil because it is oleophobic. This is a brief comparison what we made it uh, uh, for the uh, polymeric uh, uh, membranes, be it PVDF or uh, PE membranes, right? And we also offer the two years of uh, uh, warranty, right? Uh, with uh, 20 years of uh, uh, life. I'll just quickly, yeah. It's the same uh, thing. Uh, yeah, these are our uh, uh, esteemed customer where we have executed uh, um, our MBR systems. I'll, I'll just brief about Ovivo. I haven't talked about uh, Ovivo, what Ovivo is. It's a Canadian company deals with uh, water and wastewater treatment. Uh, we have an expertise of uh, 150 plus years, right? Uh, we are grown by acquiring many companies. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, logos. 
the, there are uh, they are uh, the global brands uh, which uh, uh, OVO has acquired over a period of years. Right uh, now, um, we own those uh, those brands globally, and we are a pure water treatment company. It's a technology driven company. Right, uh, we have host of uh, technologies. This is just a history of how OVO have been formed. I'll I'll just skip this. It started from uh, it started from uh, 1991, acquiring a company called Doro Liver in US, and thereafter uh, they didn't uh, look back. Right? Yeah, it's, we have built an integral uh, platform uh, like uh, India. If you see the India is considered as a knowledge and service center, and we are also uh, a center of excellence for biological forces sitting in India office. Right, we have been supporting our global offices, uh, be it uh, North American market or uh, European market. We have uh, uh, fifty-five plus engineers in India, right, uh, who supports domestic as well as uh, global projects. Yeah, these are our products uh, which uh, we have been selling in Indian market. Uh, I'll be, I'll be happy to connect online, offline to discuss more on these uh, products and technology. Essentially, we are very active in municipal and industrial uh, market. Thank you. Thanks, Sujit, for this presentation. We do have a few questions that I will be taking up that have come up from the audience. So yeah. uh, one of the first questions we have from Anthony Fernandez is mm -hmm. asking, what is the function of the splitter box shown in the uh, diagram that you had given at the start? Splitter box actually, uh, it's not essential. Splitter box is not essential, but uh, in in a package treatment plant, uh, we give those splitter box because in a, with this splitter box, usually you will have two MBR streams, right? It's not essential. You will have one MBR stream. The splitter box is to divide the flow to both the MBR tanks. Whenever you have multiple MBR uh, trains, you will have those uh, splitter box. Okay, uh, we have Bharat Londe who is asking a question. Are silicon membranes used only for municipal wastewater or they can be used for industrial wastewater also? Uh, this is uh, uh, this membrane is more designed for industrial wastewater because of its robustness. You can abuse this membrane as much as you want, right? And you can easily recover those membrane. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, very good fit for the complex effluent where polymeric doesn't work, this will work. Okay, uh, Ganesh is asking this question, how much calcium in the influent to MBR is good for optimal running? Uh, see, calcium, it will also uh, get uh, associated to the total dissolved solids. It, it depends, like higher TDS will have the issue with the biological stream, but not with my membrane, right? My membrane uh, is not um, uh, designed for the bulk. Uh, see, this membrane is uh, will be acting as a filtration system in any uh, biological stream. The issue will be when the high calcium is there with the biological uh, to grow, right? But irrespective of any uh, calcium component, right? My membrane will get scaled, but uh, you can easily recover it. So Anurag Tomar is asking a question: of How can we develop an anoxic condition? Without, without an oxygen. Okay. Uh, Rakesh Merotra is asking, according to you, what is the most important attribute required for a membrane for sewage treatment? Proper designing. Okay. For us Bharat, to have the, uh, yeah. Bharat Londe is again asking, how much is the COD reduction with a silicon membrane? Yeah, as, as I said, the, it's, it acts as a filtration unit. COD reduction will happen in the biological process, right? It depends what kind of COD is available, right? If it is for, if you're talking more about industrial effluent, we need to check for the non-biodegradable COD component of it, right? Based on that, you need to design, size your uh, um, biological process. Usually whenever you uh, design the biological process in an industrial effluent, always design it based on SRT, not on HRT basis. Uh, Dibya Ranjan Dash is asking, what is the feed limiting condition for the silicon carbide membrane and what is the membrane area available? See, uh, I, I don't know which feed limiting condition, whether it is BOD, COD, TSS, I'll, I'll, I'll answer in general. Feed limitation, limiting, there is no absolute feed limiting condition. 
depending upon the condition, I can design my system. Okay. Uh, Anthony Fernandez is again asking, when you say SIC membranes are 100% recoverable, does it mean there is no need of a replacement or that the replacement frequency is better compared to other? Uh, see, because, because these membranes are made out of inert material, it comes out of 8 mm thickness, right? Uh, you, the life is 20 years, right? And we have been giving you 12 years warranty. Replacement can happen. I'm not telling it might not happen because this is a bit of brittleness. If you, let, let's say during any maintenance activity, if you break any plates, you need to replace. Otherwise, in operation, this membrane really plates will never break. Okay. Uh, Sudhir is asking, what is TMP? It's transmembrane pressure. Okay. Uh, Amisha is asking, how suitable is your membrane for a packaged containerized treatment plant? And how automation friendly is the cleaning? Yeah, it is. Uh, since this module comes with six meter square area, this is best fit for any uh, modular uh, MBR system. And automation, we can play uh, with the automation, like um, depending upon the size of the plant, right? There's minimal op uh, automation, there's a medium automation, there's a fully um, high end of uh, automation. We can do that. Uh, Anthony Fernandez is asking, do these membranes break or impact on fall? Uh, come again? Sorry, uh, Mr. Kala. Do these membranes break whenever there is an impact or a fall? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's a, if, you, if you break it, it'll fall. Uh, sorry, it'll break. It's a ceramic membrane, right? It's it's like your cup. Uh, like the uh, early morning, you drink a tea in a ceramic cup, right? If you drop it, it'll break it. Okay, uh, Dinesh Tiwari is asking, how is this different to nano filtration membranes? No, nano filtration is uh, totally different uh, because uh, the pore size here is 0 0.1 micron. In any nano filtration, the pore size is 0 0.001. Okay, so you, it, it's not a nano filtration. Yep. So Sushil Chadda is asking, what is the footprint per MLD? Uh, per MLD, I I would say like uh, compared to conventional, you will have 40 to 45 percent less. Okay, Bharat Londe is again asking, does this silicon membrane help in reducing API or antibiotics concentration? No, but uh, it will not uh, help in reducing, but uh, it can withstand those conditions, right? And get uh, it, this membrane can be used for um, uh, treatment. Okay, Vinod Narkhade is asking, is MBR a replacement to UFRO? MBR is uh, a replacement to UF, I would say. Okay. I'll take one final question. Uh, Montu Lakhani is asking, how far your membrane is comfortable with distillery effluent where BOD, COD is very high? Yeah. As I said, like we, we, we are not concerned, um, um, uh, dependent on uh, BOD, COD because it's a biological process. Anyway, you're doing it separately. My system does the uh, filtration part of it. As far as you have the uh, proper uh, uh, biological system design done, my system will work, right? Worst case scenario, it will get fouled, but still you can recover it back. Okay. Prema Chandra Shastri is asking, can the silicon carbide membranes exactly replicate the pore size of polymeric membranes? It cannot exactly replicate because the polymeric membranes has got uh, various uh, sizes starting from 0.01 to 0 0.08, uh, if I'm not wrong, whereas we stand at 0.1 to the, it's, it's at the beginning of ultrafiltration, I would say. Okay. Uh, final question, Sujit Ganesh uh, is asking, does any recycled paper mill is currently using MBR with your membranes in India? Uh, not really. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we, in fact, uh, we are uh, we intend to do a pilot. Uh, we are already in dialogue with a company called Unido, right? They are a governing body for paper mills. Like uh, we very soon will be doing a pilot. Okay. Uh, Sujit, we still do have a few questions, but because of paucity of time, what we will do is that we will send across these questions to you, and maybe you could answer them directly with the attendees who are asking. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. So thanks, uh, Sujit. Thanks for taking time out and sharing the product specifications and the technology details with us. And we will share, uh, you know, the questions with you. And if I can request, if you can answer them uh, to the uh, 
attendees directly? Yeah, sure. It will be my pleasure. Definitely will do that. Thanks. Thanks, Sujit. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, moving on to our next session, as I said, we have always tried to do uh, different kinds of sessions which could be of benefits to our attendees and viewers. And it is our extreme privilege and honor today to have with us Dr. Mrutunjai uh, Chaube, Environment and Sustainability Head at UPL and one of the leading uh, experts in this space. And he's going to talk to us about uh, his latest book uh, on this particular uh, topic. So welcome to you, uh, Dr. Chaube. Good afternoon. Uh, Am I so, audible? Yeah, so I can hear you, Dr. Chaube. So to start off with the benefit of our viewers, can you give us a brief about this book of yours and what does it uh, exactly cover? Yes. So good afternoon. And uh, let me thank uh, Smart Water and Waste World to organizing this webinar. Also thank to, I think, more than 400 attendees are there on this live season. So thanks to all for a sparing time. So uh, I shall first say a brief about my book. Uh, the name of my book is Wastewater Treatment Technologies Design Considerations. And um, it was uh, published by Wiley Publication from their US and UK office. So first, uh, maybe five, seven minutes, I shall brief about the book through one presentation, and then we will have a question and answer session. So just I'm going to share uh, the book presentation. Is it uh, the slide is coming? Yes, sir. Can you go full screen, please? Yes. Yes. So uh, this is about uh, my book, Wastewater Treatment Technologies Design Considerations. And um, uh, this was uh, published by Wiley Publication. Uh, simultaneously, they are published from their UK office and USA office. Uh, now this book have seven chapters and in seven chapters, uh, I have covered a lot of things. And uh, I can see personally, if you ask from me, uh, I have covered my experience of 30 year in the wastewater treatment. So 24 year I am in the industry and six year in academy. So nearly from last 30 year, I am involved so I thought to write this book. And uh, this book uh, is divided into seven chapters. Uh, first chapter is on global perspective of wastewater treatment. And there uh, I have covered uh, issues related to the uh, water treatment globally. And uh, a lot of things was covered in, in that chapter. The interesting part is uh, about the how the different environmental regulations related to wastewater are in the different part of world. And also, I have given some perspective on the deep sea discharge, because uh, when we are doing the deep sea discharge in different part of world, then I found that uh, the regulation is not consistent. And you will see in US something, in UK something, in India something. But as a sea, if you see as a ocean, then, then it's going in the common ocean. So that I have covered in my book. And also in first chapter, you will see that uh, I have shared that in last 30 years, how the uh, scenario in the wastewater treatment has changed. Before 30 years, if you see, it was a conventional kind of design uh, based upon just to meet the regulation. But today, a smarter modular design requirement is there to meet the uh, recycling and reuse requirement. Uh, in second chapter, um, I have covered wastewater characteristics. So nearly 30 kind of industry characteristics has been covered in the chapter second. And then uh, in chapter third, wastewater treatment, the fourth is the design consideration. So detailed design has been covered in my book. And uh, fourth chapter is 
I, I think fifth chapter. Fifth chapter is advanced sustainable wastewater treatment. So there, uh, you will not find several new sustainable technologies in any uh, textbook right now, like a scale band technology, forward osmosis, volute, and um, uh, uh, wet uh, air oxidation. Yes, you found, but solar detoxification. I have added, so solar detoxification is the new thing. So several advanced wastewater treatment technologies has been covered in chapter fifth. Chapter six is devoted toward the zero liquid discharge. So uh, that chapter is very interesting that what all technologies are available for ZLD. And also I have given an overview that uh, what is the techno-economic feasibility of ZLD. And some of the interesting fact I have incorporated that ZLD may not be environment friendly if you have a proper wastewater discharge facility like common effluent treatment plant, deep sea discharge, then if, uh, there is a no environmental benefit if you implement ZLD. So those kind of things also covered in this chapter. And the last chapter is devoted toward the wastewater treatment, operational excellence and troubleshooting. So that's about the book. This book is available on all the commercial e-sites on the uh, Wiley library online. It is available. It is also available on Amazon. So you, you can go on Amazon, just type either my name or book name. You, you will get the link and uh, you can purchase from there. A part of this is several e-commerce site, eBay, Redself, and uh, so many, because Wiley has put on worldwide several websites, very easily available, this book from the websites. So uh, now this is uh, about the book. Then now we will go for the question and answer session. And uh, this is my contact link. If anyone want anything about my book, then they can contact me. So fine. Yeah. So Dr. Chomi, yeah. Yeah. can I uh, ask a few questions, sir? Yes, yes. You can ask the question. I think let me show this. This is the book, okay. which is with me. And uh, uh, so, OK, fine. Uh, you can go ahead with your questions. So sir, my first question is, obviously, there have been several books in the market on waste water treatment. What one is that what prompted you to write about a book on wastewater treatment, considering there is already a lot of books around? And what are the special features in this book that helps it set up a, itself apart? Okay. So I think the uh, why I have written this book to answer your question. I think the first thing was in mind, in my mind that uh, uh, from last 30 years, uh, I am involved in the wastewater treatment designs. 24 years in various industry. So uh, I started in Pentair, then I went into cell, and we implemented several wastewater treatment in refinery of uh, cell. Then I moved to Unilever. So in Unilever also, nearly 500 companies are there around the world. So we came across several wastewater treatment issues and design considerations. And now I am with UPL. So here also globally, a lot of issue comes while dealing the wastewater treatment of agrochemical. So I think the that is the main idea that uh, uh, six years while I was in IIT, uh, reading on academic side on the wastewater and 24 years in the industry. So all 30 years, what experience I get with the wastewater treatment, especially design, operation, new technology. So that lets document, and, and that is the main idea. Second thing is that nowadays, uh, this is very important to embed the sustainable wastewater treatment technologies. And the sustainable wastewater treatment technologies, like uh, uh, you can say volute for the sludge handling, forward osmosis, a scale band technology and uh, vacuum distillation, 
these all are the new technology and also mbbr is not new but yes from 10 year it's popular inside the industry so that should be also covered in a textbook and the all design methodology design consideration should be given so that was also my idea and that has been presented in this book and uh, last point uh, which is very important uh, i used to face the problem whenever we design the waste water treatment plant we don't get a proper correct tracing so when you are going to design the waste water treatment plant especially industrial waste water treatment then you must know what is the characteristics of inlet effluent like ph bod cod tds tss so i have summarized in this book nearly 30 industry effluent characteristics and that is based practical means what characteristic i got uh, while operating those plants and uh, so practical uh, 30 industries characteristics that has been summarized and uh, mainly for the fmcg industry chemical industry agrochemical industry and uh, several kind of refinery and uh, so many more 30 kind of industries characteristics are there so i think that is a very good part in this book where any designer can refer those characteristics Uh, so in at the start you mentioned about the deep sea discharge standards and how uh, you know they are uh, different in your experience can you throw a, a little bit more light about this deep sea discharge standards ah uh, yes i i think uh, deep sea discharge is a very interesting thing and in my book uh, in the chapter global perspective of waste water treatment i have covered in detail and uh, what is there that uh, when you are sending your effluent treated effluent into deep sea discharge then a lot of cost get uh, accrued and i think it is a very good things for the waste water treatment that first you treat meet the discharge standard and send to the deep sea discharge but what i found that when you see the us epa norm in us then their standard is for uh, uh, agrochemical industry if you see then they are allowing 4000 ppm cod uh, 2000 ppm bod and 2000 tss to discharge into the deep sea but if you see the india standard then in india we have put the limit of 250 ppm cod and 30 ppm bod and 100 ppm tss so very stringent and why it is because in india we have only one norm whether you discharge on ground whether you discharge in the river or whether you discharge in the deep sea our norm say that everywhere same standard but if you see the us epa then they have make different a standard for the different mode of discharge so those things have been elaborated in my book that what us epa norm is what india norm is what is uk norm is what brazil so several part of world has been covered and uh, it was concluded that in india we have the a stringent norm for the deep sea discharge Uh, sir i'll take a few questions that have come in from the audience so bharat is asking he does the book uh, cover the treatment of api and antibiotics treatment because this is currently a very high agenda for pharmaceutical companies yes pharmaceutical company i have covered in my book even the characteristics also has been summarized treatment scheme has been also summarized and even in the deep sea discharge a standard also for pharma industry what us epa norm is and what our india norm is that has been also summarized in this book uh, sir dilip kumar chatwal is also asking is the book also covering case studies or literature around sugar plants because he says that they are very seasonal and are very difficult to handle before and after the closure of the season yes sugar industry has been covered in this and and personally i i have been 
uh, with several wastewater treatment plant uh, to treat the sugar industry wastewater. So those uh, treatment approach and design methodology has been covered in this. So Rupali is asking this book, uh, question that can this book be useful for non-technical people also who are interested in knowing more about this industry? I think it is mainly for them uh, because uh, I have tried to write in such a way that people can easily understand and I personally feel that uh, wastewater treatment is not a just a water management issue, but it is a health issue also. Because today, if you see uh, uh, United Nations Water World Development Report, then as per the report, it's saying that 80% wastewater globally going untreated into the river and in environment. And because of that, one WHO estimate is coming that nearly 2.2 million people killed every year because of water related and waterborne disease. So I personally feel that wastewater treatment is not a water management issue, but it is also a health issue. And uh, uh, to have a knowledge how to treat wastewater, uh, I have written this book and uh, it is even for those people who don't have sound knowledge in wastewater, if they will start reading this book, they can also able to design the wastewater treatment. Uh, Dr. Chobe, Anthony Fernandez is asking that is this book only about technology information or can it help engineers to design and operate wastewater treatment plants through some examples that you might have in the book? Yes, so for design, I think uh, two chapter has been devoted uh, with examples and uh, for operators, how to operate the plant. So last chapter six is regarding operational excellence and troubleshooting. So the last seventh chapter is fully dev devoted for the operation of wastewater treatment. So in your book, while it's talking about your book, you mentioned about ZD. And you said that you have an exclusive chapter dedicated around uh, ZLD. Can you share with the audience your views on ZLD uh, based on your experience? So on ZLD means uh, zero liquid discharge in industry. Uh, my view is that uh, in those areas where there is a no proper discharge of wastewater treatment facility available, and very water scarce location, yes, establishment of concept of JLD is good for those areas. But it cannot be generalized. Means right now, so, we are making a general norm that let make JLD mandatory everywhere, uh, especially in those areas. If you go in Gujarat, coastal area, so we have deep sea discharge facility, we have common effluent treatment plant, so in those areas, I found that ZLD is not an environment-friendly technology. And why? Because in my book, I have presented a case study and calculation, and it's showing that suppose if you are meeting just discharge standard, and if you are implementing ZLD, then ZLD consume four times more energy. Uh, emission of carbon emission happened four times more than the normal discharge standard. Uh, hazardous waste get generated 2.5 times more in the ZLD. And also, if you see the capex, it is 2.5 times more and operating cost is three times more. So I think the techno-economic assessment clearly saying that ZLD is not environment friendly because it is going to uh, emit carbon emission four times more than the normal wastewater treatment, which just meet the discharge standard. And a very elaborate one chapter has been included in my book. And uh, so, so my conclusion is this, that if proper discharge facility is not available, if location is a water scarce location, yes, go for the ZLD. But if proper discharge facility available, then 
it's better to meet the discharge standard and send to the deep sea discharge rather than making it ZLD everywhere. Sir, we have heard that after the release of this book, that there have been reactions from the Indian government also in trying to, uh, you know, uh, they have given feedback, it seems, about the issues that you have raised in the book. Can you share something about that? I think, uh, yes, uh, one at Ministry of Environment Forest, uh, mainly on the deep sea discharge and JLD. So the committee has been set up uh, by the Ministry of Environment Forest to look into the ZLD feasibility. And also a separate committee has been set up to look into deep sea discharge standard. And uh, recently I heard that the Gujarat government has also um, asked to review uh, ZLD. Uh, so, so I think uh, these two things, two developments happen. So, so, sir, uh, also a little tricky question, also something that people have put up in my... Uh, the qu question is that, don't you think that the book is a little costly? You know, you're talking of nearly eight to 10,000 rupees. Uh, you know, uh, the feedback is that the book seems to be a little expensive. Uh, you are right. I think the 10,000 rupees, yes, that Indian context, uh, uh, it is costly and my aim was to make it uh, cheaper, but the problem is that uh, uh, Wiley, Wiley has published this book and that is a US the, from US and UK. And if you see the Wiley, uh, they are very, uh, very renowned publishing house for the technical book around the world and their technical books uh, start in this range. Means, uh, in Indian, uh, maybe hundred dollar US dollar. This book cost one twenty US dollar. So between hundred to one fifty dollar, uh, it's it's normal cost uh, by the wildlife publications. So cost was not in my hand, and uh, truly, uh, speaking from me, yes, uh, we should make it affordable. Uh, but right now, it is beyond my control. Okay, so one final question is that while this book seems to be very, very useful for the wastewater treatment designers, uh, do you think that, you know, uh, there could be a lot of information and data in this for even the operators and managers? I, I, I think your voice is breaking. Yes, sir. So, so just uh, Chobe, I am not sure if you can hear me. Yes, yes. Now I am hearing. Uh, now I am hearing. So, uh, yes, uh, if you see for operator, uh, this book is very good for the designer, but also it is very good for the operator because the last chapter, chapter number seven, uh, I have covered uh, wastewater operation excellence and troubleshooting. So that chapter is very good and relevant for the operators. And there they can able to see uh, that how to make the logbook and uh, how to analyze the characteristics. Also, while operating the plant, uh, what care they should take and what kind of parameter they should use to measure. Also nowadays we have to uh, implement online measuring instrument. So those things have been also covered in this book, how to install the online instruments and how to measure the online all parameters. So I think for operators, this is very good. And, and they can also, when they will read this book, then they will also found very useful. Thank you, Dr. Chaube, for taking time out of your busy schedule and sharing about this book. I'm sure the community at large will benefit a lot from this book 
and hopefully we will have many such books from you in the future sir right right thank you thank so you so we will share with all our attendees today on the details on how you can you know procure this books we will share the links of where it is available and in case uh, anybody wants to reach out to uh, uh, you know the doctor directly we would be more than happy to share his contact details so thank you dr chobe for this session thank you thank you uh, moving to our next session for the day uh, today i would now like to invite uh, colonel uh, bhaskar tatwavadi he is the director at double shot spt limited and he is going to talk about the understanding process water requirements and management over to you colonel tatwavadi thank you and good afternoon good evening uh, and good morning to my friends in india and uh, canada uh, i would like to begin uh, this discussion with a very small uh, powerpoint presentation and then uh, we will move on to the questions and answers is my screen visible to all no sir no sir you will have to click on the Just share screen moment. button click on the share screen button and share it just a moment is it now visible yes sir it is okay so uh, understanding process water requirements and management uh, for the water required by the pharma and the semiconductors industries in other words the requirements for ultra pure water Uh, is what i am going to discuss today very briefly in this second season fourth episode of the iwet series uh, at the outset i thank mr kaila shirodkar and his team at smart water and waste world for giving me this opportunity to share some of these uh, requirements for very very high grade ultra pure water which is required by these industries i shall start with the pharmaceuticals industries water requirement and uh, i think it is always a good idea to start with the market size of the particular industry about which we want to talk now uh, there are some figures uh, about the pharma industry which uh, say that the global production in 2021 was 486 billion dollars and it is uh, slated to increase to 958 billion dollars by 2028 at 11 per 11.34% at 11.34 CAGR of this uh, the indian production component was about 42 billion in 2021 now when the market size or the revenues are talked about uh, the 2021 revenues increased to 1.25 trillion from 1.22 trillion in 2021 uh, 
we are all uh, undergoing the third wave of the pandemic and uh, the pharma sector has seen a boost during the pandemic and quite understandably with our Indian share of the production and the logistics of supplying the several millions and billions of doses of the uh, vaccines, uh, the government of India has now decided to boost the sector and has permitted foreign direct investments up to 100% for manufacturing medical devices. The focus is on cost efficiency, economic drivers, and by way of policy supports and investments, including FDI. Now, all this is going to have a direct impact on the water required by the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, there are several uh, guidelines and uh, directives on the water quality required by the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, water for pharmaceutical use, WPU is a term which is very commonly used uh, across the industry. A working document in May 20 was issued by World Health Organization. Uh, it was titled Good Manufacturing Practices, GMP, Water for Pharmaceutical Use. And it basically focused on the production of pharma grade water water for injection, which is also called WFI, by means other than distillation. Uh, you see earlier, distillation was considered the only process to produce water fit for injection purposes. Now, with the advent of several other physicochemical processes other than uh, distillation, uh, we have multiple options to reach the same level of purity. The important thing about the pharmaceutical water is the microbiological and the chemical quality of water, which has to be controlled through the several stages of production, storage, and distribution. There are two uh, major pharmacopoeial requirements and which provide guidance for uh, production of WFI. Uh, the international pharmacopoeias uh, are basically from Europe, that is the European pharmacopoeia and the US pharmacopoeia. They give the uh, requirements for bulk purified water, bulk highly purified water, and bulk water for injections. The European Medical Agency or the EMA guidelines were issued in 2020 to cover uh, these grades. And in this table, I have listed the, uh, the, the parameters for purified water as well as water for injection, both by the European pharmacopoeia and the United States pharmacopoeia. The, they list total organic carbon, conductivity, nitrates, heavy metals, aerobic bacteria, and bacterial endotoxins. And uh, there are slight differences, yet the, the quality of the water required uh, generally remains the same. I'm not going into the process details uh, right now about the production of these grades of water. Uh, we'll touch upon that a little later. Now, first I will talk about the water requirement of the semiconductors industries or the semiconductor sector. Here again, if we go by the uh, global uh, business in the semiconductors, it rose from $426 billion to $452 billion in the last year. And is expected to grow to $803 billion by 2028. You see, everything that we do, including the, this uh, presentation which you are watching and the uh, 
electricity which comes to your home, these several gadgets which we use, the automobiles, the, the, the cell phones, you name it, and the semiconductors are there in every, they form a component of all the gadgets, every machine. And in addition to that, they are also vital for the growth of artificial intelligence, internet of things, and machine learning. Consumer goods, including your refrigerators, washing machines, anything that you have that you use in your homes, they use the semiconductors. In the Asia Pacific region, the semiconductors market growth from 2020 to 2022, the two years, is expected to more than double and rise from $230 billion to almost $573 billion. When we talk about India, the Indian market size, which was 113,000 crores in 2020, is expected to grow to 470,000 crores Indian rupees by 2026. And considering that due to the pandemic, there have been several logistical disruptions in the supply chain of semiconductors, the government of India has taken upon itself to encourage the growth of semiconductor industry in the country and has invested. It is going to have has, has declared its intention to invest $10 billion and to also uh, provide incentives to the tune of about $30 billion in the coming years. When we talk about the global players, the most important players in the semiconductor industry include the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, Intel, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Samsung, Toshiba, SK Hynix, NVIDIA, and NXP. There are several other smaller players, but these are the ones who rule the market. Now, we can all, we must all understand that the ultra pure water which is required for semiconductors manufacturing is a step ahead of the water required by the pharma industry. And now I will just run you through a typical scheme of ultra pure water production. And this system requires an integration of several treatment technologies, including reverse osmosis, electro deionization, and ion exchange. The pretreatment starts for the drinking water or the water which is fit for human consumption, which is used as free feed water. It's pre-treated. Then it goes through a heat exchanger, goes through two passes in series of reverse osmosis, reverse osmosis one and reverse osmosis two, degasified, has its first shot of ultraviolet uh, radiation, 254 grade. And then it is subjected to ion exchange or electro deionization. It is again passed through a second level of ion exchange resins and then stored in ultra pure water tanks. Before use, Another dose of UV radiation, 185 grade, is given. Uh, deionization by another ion exchange bed is done. And finally, it has to pass through an ultrafiltration filter for production. Now, this is the process which starts with drinking water and ends in the ultra pure water which is required for production of the chips. 
an ultra pure water plant looks something like this this is a picture of the hynix ultra pure water plant i will give you just a few uh, details about the the quality which is required for the production of chips these uh, details include resistivity at 25 degrees the uh, concentration of ammonium bromide chloride fluoride nitrate nitrides phosphates sulfates calcium lithium magnesium potassium and sodium the point to note here is that these are all represented in picograms per milliliter so you can imagine the kind of water that is required and which is ultra ultra or super ultra pure water as far as the semiconductor industry is concerned about 100 milli million liters of ultra pure water is used daily for the production of uh, semiconductors this is as per the available information but this is this number is going to increase by another 4 to 5 times in the coming years there are several quality management issues when we talk about uh, the ultra pure water because when you see the level of purity that is required and the the concentration of several uh, you know impurities and you also see the uh, entire process of purification you will understand that the store, the the through the process of purification followed by its transport or its journey through the several pipes and pipe fittings and its storage there are issues related to its quality and its quality has to remain steadfast through the entire process so the uh, the the quality management issues start with production process selection and the output prevention of changes in the physical chemical attributes is most important in the post production storage it has to be in sterile environment the material of the storage tanks is very important similarly the piping and special quality is vital and then when it uh, is uh, uh, flowing into the tubes during distribution during the production process the flow has to be continuous there have to be online quality checks the waste water has to be isolated it cannot be permitted to mix with the ultra pure water the waste water has to be collected effectively removed from the process sites and treated and the emp as in the european manage, management european practices guidelines for pharma sector and the sops for semiconductor manufacturing units they govern the ultra pure water quality management from its production to disposal stages and these have been elaborated in the several pharmacopias as well as these guidelines uh, that is the end of my presentation here uh, my contact details are here now we can go to questions and answers if you have any so, questions i will be ha happy to answer so uh, colonel tatwa the one thanks for sharing the complexities involved you know uh, in the water quality required for the pharma and the semiconductor industry and also the opportunities involved so a, a query that i have is how does this production of ultra pure water you know differ from the normal drinking water i mean we saw the different stages but if you could tell us what is the essential difference between an ultra pure water and a normal drinking water uh yes uh, the ultra pure water process starts where you know the drinking water treatment ends so as far as the drinking water treatment is concerned 
there are standards uh, given by the World Health Organization. We have our Indian standards, which normally follow the WHO standards. And when we do uh, treatment for drinking water, we have a set of processes. And then when the end product, uh, what we call is the drinking water, is normally supplied by the municipalities like the MCGM. And it is supposed to adhere to certain quality standards. Now, this drinking water is the raw material for production of ultra pure water. And therein lies the difference. So the, the end of the treatment process for drinking water is the beginning of the process for production of ultra pure water. Uh, so sir, considering now the complexity of the treatment processes that you have just shown, now, what is the likelihood then of capacity expansions in the pharma or the semiconductor set. I mean, the semiconductor is a completely new sunrise sector. But considering this complexity, what is the scope for the growth or capacity expansion in the pharma sector? Uh, you see, the semiconductor industry, uh, like pharma, has certain gradations. Uh, in pharma, we have the bulk drugs which uh, are produced with normal drinking water quality. And then we move on to the purified water and the uh, water for injection. So these are gradations of water which are used in the uh, pharma industry. Likewise, when it comes to the semiconductor industry, there are uh, gradations of semiconductors and the highest and the purest or the ultra pure water quality is used for the highest grade chips which are then utilized, which have certain applications. However, the chips which are used in other, our day-to-day -day, uh, operated machines, the home appliances, they are of a slightly inferior quality. And therefore, these, are, these do not require the ultra pure water quality, which, uh, a, which, which comes out of the process diagram which I showed in my presentation. Another thing is that uh, there is an incentive by the government to set up the semiconductor plants in India. And uh, again, I draw a parallel with the pharma industry. Why the pharma industry has grown in India is because we started with the production of bulk drugs and then these bulk drugs were exported to the entire uh, global community, including Africa. And that is how the revenues came and the industry had enough money to, for, to go in for uh, you know, sophisticated research and development. Similarly, as the uh, semiconductor industry starts operating in India and starts producing the bulk uh, grade chips which are used in manufacturing, uh, then uh, uh, it will be easier to move on to sophisticated manufacture and uh, uh, the ultra pure water requirements will increase gradually in relation to the kind of production that we are looking at. So, so sir, a query I have is, uh, I mean, we talk about the growth of the semiconductor industry in India. Uh, the government has also announced, I believe, a 76,000 crore package for uh, you know the semiconductor industry in India. And I believe that 20 leading uh, business houses have already given expressions of interest that they want to set up these factories here. So what are these location-based constraints that could be there for the development of the semiconductor factories in India? Uh, yes, uh, this is a an excellent question. Actually, uh, if you see the quality of water that is produced or the ultra pure water that is required by these industries, the important thing to note is that the air quality or the ambience within the factory or the ambient air quality within the factory has to be absolutely sterile without a speck of dust. Similarly, water has to be available. The air surrounding has to be extremely clean. And there are several issues related to the 
climatic changes, the temperatures, the microclimate uh, management, and therefore uh, the, the locations ideally should be away from habitation. But as per the information which is available, some of the likely locations are the national capital region, which is uh, to my mind an absolutely unsuitable location. Uh, there could be some other locations in uh, Gujarat or uh, down south uh, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, some of the factors governing also include the, the, the presence of the uh, multinationals. For instance, uh, Samsung is there in NCR and uh, the uh, Samsung is one of the major players in the uh, semiconductors. Uh, and uh, there are several Indian companies which are uh, in different stages of uh, you know, negotiating with the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing uh, company. And eventually where these plants come up uh, is anybody's guess. So sir, I'll take a few questions from the audience. So Dibya Ranjan Das is asking ki, why is the heat exchanger required? Do we need to maintain a specific temperature during the treatment? Uh, there is a removal of what is known as pyrogens involved. And that is why that uh, the heat exchanger is required. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Ravi Chandra Singh Jankar is asking, do you know of any OEMs active in providing plants for ultra pure water? Uh, there are several uh, um, process manufacturers who are producing, you know, again, package plants uh, for pharma as well as uh, for the semiconductor industry. As I said, the entire uh, gamut of the processes uh, shown in my slide does not, is not always required. Uh, for the semiconductors, which may be of uh, inferior grade. So uh, yes, uh, I know of some uh, vendors who are uh, working uh, to provide these uh, package plants, uh, combining uh, several processes on the same skid. Okay, so Meena Ketan is asking, is ultra pure water similar to distilled water? Uh, it is, uh, I would go a uh, step ahead and say it is better than distilled water. Okay. Uh, Braj Mishra is asking, what are the instrument techniques for detecting PICO level of impurities? Uh, most of the uh, instrumentation involved in this and the measurements is uh, through online sensors and uh, such sensors are available because as the as the standards uh, are prescribed there is no uh, 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 what should i say rationale in prescribing standards which may cannot be measured so uh, yes uh, it is it is uh, possible to uh, measure these using uh, special sensors okay uh, mohammed uh, nazir is asking Asking what is the conductivity difference in both the waters? So I'm assuming ultra pure water and normal drinking water. Uh, it could be of several uh, times. Uh, for the ultra pure water, I have mentioned in the slide uh, in my presentation. So it could be 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, even more. Okay. Uh, Montu Lakhani is asking the question saying, sir, if we consider a chips factory setup, what is the budget for ultra pure water treatment plant? And what is the ratio for production with water generated? I mean, I don't know if you have this data offhand. Uh, I was reading somewhere that a 300 mm chip typically uses 1000 liters or one kiloliter of ultra pure water, which in turn could be coming from at least 20 to 30 kiloliters of normal drinking water. That okay. is as far as the water uh, is concerned. Now, okay. if he's talking about this, the, the setting up of a semiconductor plant, I, I, I won't hazard any guess. Okay. Uh, sir, Dibya Ranjan Dash is again asking, what is the temperature to be considered to remove spirogen? Uh, 
typical values which are uh, given for the um, uh, testing of ultra pure water is 25 degrees celsius okay uh, uh, i'll take this final question sir from vasant kothalkar he is asking are there any set parameters for ultra pure water i have uh, mentioned in the slide what are the parameters okay uh, we will share the presentation with all our attendees yeah kindly do that varun shukla is asking is there any wastage of water when you are producing ultra pure water you see uh, yes of course this water i mean uh, the, the entire 1000 liters of ultra pure water once the chip is produced becomes waste water and has to be recirculated for uh, recirculated reclaimed treated and reused okay uh i think people are just sending in the questions here how do we then manage it i mean if it is entire 1000 liters of water yes. after the chip is manufactured you said it either has to be uh, discharged or re reused right yes it has to be reclaimed using the same process it would even the waste water produced in the manufacture of semiconductors perhaps would give us waste water which is better than our drinking water quality okay so so uh, karnal tatwavadi thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule and you know sharing uh, this thing for us i am sure i think our attendees have now realized that maybe the while we knew pharma was always a, a, a good sector but i think there could be many opportunities going forward in the semiconductor sector i think sujit oh, yes. wants to come in yeah 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 um, yeah uh, colonel uh, baskar it was a really fantastic uh, um, outlook which you have given uh, about uh, semiconductor industry ovivo is one of the uh, preferred supplier for semiconductor industry we have been working with uh, intel we taiwan uh, semiconductor manufacturing unit i don't know like how we can um, Uh, have collaboration in Indian market. Uh, I'll, I'll just connect um, after this call to understand like how Ovivo can add values um, in association with you. Most certainly, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. Sujit, I will share the details for Colonel Tatwa Wadi with you, and I would leave it. You know, the two of you to take it up from there. So sure. uh, this brings us to the end of the fourth uh, edition of uh, the IVET series. Uh, we have in this particular uh, episode tried to do a little different from the typical technical presentations that we have been following and i hope that you know these sessions have been relevant to you and uh, you know i would look forward to any feedback from you uh, in case of you know should we continue these kind of sessions uh, more or you know we should go only for you know the typical technology uh, kind of sessions Uh, i would like to thank all of our speakers sujit dr chobhe uh, francis karnal tatwavadi and yasmin for you know taking uh, or being with us throughout the entire sessions and taking time out and sharing their knowledge with us and most importantly uh, a special thanks to all the attendees uh, you know uh, for supporting the iwet series over the last i would say now close to around 10 episodes that we have done in the last one year we look forward to your continued support we will have two more episodes till we finish season 2 at the end of march and then like always we will take a small break before coming back with season 3 so looking forward to your continued support and we will look forward to joining you back again in february we will announce the date soon so thank you all for this session thank you so much thank you bye bye thank, thank you. you thank you